So we just got done with Ubisoft's E3 2018 presentation, and it was certainly a live presentation. That you just heard was one of the many times Ubisoft, for some reason, whoever was in charge of that soundboard for the microphones and, and who's on and off, did a terrible job, by the way, at this presentation. It seems to be the risk you run when you do live presentations. I think that's why a lot of places are uh, getting away from it. One, there's a, there's a lot, a really good chance. A lot of times it happens that you're gonna mess up in some way. And two, it's probably cheaper not to do them. Like right off the bat, Ubisoft kicks it off with, uh, with, a, with a live dancing musical number to promote Just Dance 2019, a game that I think is going to the Wii. The, the Wii, the, the, the Wii, not even like the Wii U, the Wii. They've been playing Just Dance on the Wii for a while, believe it or not. That's actually one of the few series that has continued on there because you don't really need much to put on there. And honestly, I bet you it sells pretty well on the Wii, to be completely honest, based on what people bought the original Wii for. Yeah, they, they're, probably, they're probably buying that up. But they did that. They started off with that. It, the thing about this, you're going you're gonna to figure this out pretty quick as we go along. The Ubisoft presentation was, it was quite long. It was like an hour and... 40 minutes like it, it felt long and I think honestly this could have been it, it, at the most an hour long but this is one of those situations where they, it just goes and goes and goes and you know they have like the spots where people where the guy came in on the motorcycle and ran through the podium things that aren't needed I, I guess they want to do it to try to be uh, you know showmans about it but even even Digital Devolver doesn't take this long and there's a uh, hundred times more entertaining than most of these well probably all of these uh, presentations so they get to Beyond Good and Evil 2 and it looks better than the last time we saw it it looks way more interesting because at the end you see Jade who appears to be uh, evil or just bad or, or, or aggressive and this is set to be a prequel Jade of course is from the first one so it looks like they're going to, I guess, uh, uh, give us an idea of, of how she be, uh, became or, or showed up in the first one. And she definitely seems uh, bad in this one, uh, I, it, it, antagonistic. I, it's going to be interesting to see. I like the CGI trailer, by the way. I know it didn't really show us much, but I liked the, the production value they put into it. And I, I think it, it's going to be a good game overall. But again, I need to see how big this world is that they keep talking about. They keep touting you know everything seamless no load times we saw we've seen pre-alpha footage and it wasn't super impressive to me but after seeing the cgi trailer kind of setting up some of the story and where they're going to go with the game i am very interested to see how it ends up turning out and i'll be checking it out when it does come out now they also said the world's gonna be so large it sounds like they're almost looking for people to help them decorate it they want people who are going to be doing music and artwork but they want people who are looking, I guess, to either get their name out there or maybe, I guess, get compensated. That's the thing I, I didn't really understand. They they brought out Joseph Gordon Levitt and talked about, I guess, uh, a company they co-founded with Hit Record, and that is going to, I guess, be able to pull in people's submissions and then help them sort them out and get them into the game. So I guess if you're just really into the the Beyond Good and Evil series, you're you're so happy to see two and you're an up and coming artist or or somebody who's a musician, I guess you could technically get your work into it. I'm just I'm a little curious how they're going to either compensate or what. Maybe your name's in the credits. I don't know if that's good enough for everybody, but uh, we'll see how that turns out. I'm sure that will at least make some headlines how exactly they're doing it. And that's probably going to be some questions that are going to come up during E3 week for Beyond Good and Evil 2. We also saw a new Trials game that was shown. Um, Trials is interesting because it's been around for a while and it hasn't really changed a ton. Trials is basically Excite Bike on the next generation systems, essentially. It's fun. I like it. it. It's a good time. It looks like it's going to all platforms next year in 2019. So that's cool. I think they're even doing a beta. They're talking about doing betas for everything. Ubisoft does betas for everything, apparently. Like, I think almost every game they talked about, it has a beta in some way that's coming out. It's really funny. But yeah, Trials is coming out for everything. PS4, Xbox One, PC, and Nintendo Switch next year. Division 2 was next up, and they did talk about it at length. They did show... Uh, a ton of trailers about it. They even kind of outlined where they're going to go with the game with multiple DLCs that are all free, which means there will be microtransactions to kind of support that in the game. Uh, not surprising. It's, it's a service-based game. Division 1 was a service-based game. So, of course, Division 2 will also be a service-based game. 
I like the look of it. I like the setting in Washington, D.C., and it looks like it's going to be similar in gameplay style to Division 1. Just they probably figured out a lot of the issues they had in the beginning with Division 1 because Division 1 was a journey for Ubisoft. Seriously, they've been working on that game for a while. I think they really started to pull some of the player base back. And now, from what they've learned there, it seems like they're going to kind of roll along here with the Division 2. They also pushed along the Donkey Kong DLC for Mario Rabbids. Nothing too crazy or new. They showed uh, uh, some enemies that are sharks that go in the sand and everything. Um, the June 26th, it's coming out. I like the musical score for it. They really did take like old school Donkey Kong music and kind of reformed it, reshaped it. And it was a cool cover for that, that music. And you know, it's coming out later on. I think most people who are gonna get it have already made up their mind that they're gonna get it, but they at least highlighted it in some way. Skull and Bones was shown. They showed some gameplay for it. They tried to outline it as best as they could. Visually, it does remind me a lot of Assassin's Creed Black Flag. And from what we've heard, it seems like they pulled the naval combat from that and just expanded on it. It seemed like there, there, it's, it has classes uh, for all the different ships. Like you had some, uh, a ship that was like kind of a tank and you had people who are DPS. Someone actually rams the enemy. There was a higher level enemy ship and then they all kind of ganged up on it to try to defeat it, to get loot. They did show you kind of, uh, you customize your ship several times over, you know, the mast, they had the, the big steering wheel that they used and everything. And it looked cool. I'm sure all the cannons are different as well because they did have like different rarities for each one. They had, you know, common, uncommon, probably epic, legendary, all that stuff. So it looks like you're going to have all the RPG elements that you have in certain MMOs kind of built into this because they also had different levels for all of your ships. You know, you had like level 12, 14, the, the big boss, the end was level 20. So it, it looks like it's going to be an, an online game where you and, and friends or in PvP kind of team up or fight against. And I, it, it, I don't know, I, I see this and I say, okay, I think some people will enjoy the naval combat, but I, I don't know how interesting they're actually going to make that. Is it like a big open world? Is it just set up in rooms that you go in? Like you just kind of go off on like certain quests and they set up the room that you and other people get into. Uh, it's it's going to be interesting. And then they also talked about how uh, at the end you can fight people for the loot that drops. And that sounds like it's going to be terrible. Like people are going to get so frustrated with that. But we'll see. That's also another 2019 game. They got into uh, Transference. That's the VR uh, story narrative driven game that Elijah Wood seems to be working on, or at least involved with. It looks like a creepy VR game. I mean, they're they're definitely focusing on story. And from what they, sh they were showing, it doesn't really tell us a lot about the game, somewhat. But it looks like that's going to be a game you kind of get into, and it's kind of be kind of more like a movie style game in VR, and that that's going to be fun for a lot of people. And that's actually coming out this fall, and from what we've seen, it at least looks compelling. But I don't know if it's going to be a game you're going to play over and over and over again or anything. That's kind of one of those uh, VR games where it's like buying a movie ticket essentially to have a front row seat to uh, the the movie. But we'll we'll see what happens with that. They showed more For Honor. It has a DLC called Matching Fire, and. It's For Honor. The thing about For Honor is they're trying to push people, more people in. They are making their starter kit basically free for people to, uh, I guess, just get into on Uplay. So you have to go get Uplay if you don't already have it. I just, I feel like For Honor kind of went into the same slump that The Division and Rainbow Six Siege went into. And those two have kind of come out of it. But For Honor really has not. It's, it's still kind of, the player counts down. I don't hear a lot of people talk about it. Uh, the buzz isn't very high with it. Rainbow Six Siege, I hear about all the time, right? I start, I'm start, I've been starting to hear more and more about the division since they've been working on it and fixing it, but I just, I don't ever hear about For Honor. So maybe this DLC is going to bring people back in. I, I, I'm not sure about that one. It's, I almost feel like For Honor is starting to become kind of a lost cause. It had bad PR to begin with when it came out because of, of how much of the, of the grinding you'd have to do to unlock your different heroes and stuff. But, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't know about that one. If you're a For Honor player, let me know if this DLC is interesting to you, or if you left, let me know if this is bringing you back in. Next, they showed Starlink, and I, I saw Starlink last year. They said it was on all systems last year, so it, we knew it was on the Switch, the PS4, Xbox One, everything, everything like that, and this is kind of like a Toys Come to Life thing where you get the different ships and they seem to appear in the game, and I assume they're going to try to make a lot of money on the toys as well. They're going to continue to release them. It's almost like they're physical service-based game where they continue to release goods in stores they actually have to go out and buy like amiibos like skylander figures skylander is probably what i would compare this to the most and i it's it's funny because they put Star Fox in this game and it makes a ton of sense from ubisoft's perspective it's a little 
a little weird for Nintendo to do that, but maybe they probably get royalties and stuff, and they're selling toys through it, you know, little figures and stuff, essentially. And Nintendo likes to do that with Amiibos. It's a little weird that they don't have an R-Wing Amiibo, but they instead have a, an R-Wing Starlink figure. They also have Fox and everything in there, and I assume you'll be able to customize the little R-Wing, but that is a good strategy for Ubisoft's position. For Ubisoft, I just don't know... I guess Nintendo just wants to put Fox in there. At least makes sense in the lore of Starlink. It's a, it's a space shooter. Honestly, this might end up being a better place for Fox than uh, Star Fox Zero. <laughs> Based on some of the gameplay they showed, it looked like classic Star Fox, kind of. So, the position for it makes sense. I understand why Ubisoft wants it there, and I guess Nintendo gets more money from the royalties and everything. And to them, they're just like, yeah, let's lend out our IP. The, uh, the way that they kind of introduced them was pretty funny because they had the, the stuff come up on the comm. It sounds like, like what they sounded like way back in the day in the old Nintendo games and everything, where it was kind of gibberish that they were speaking. Uh, so, you know what? It's, it's just something else, I guess, to help Starlink along. I, I'm, I don't know how well Starlink is going to do. These toy-based games tend to kind of die out over time, and I kind of see that for Starlink. If people get annoyed just having to go buy these over and over again, you get a lot of people who like to kind of pack rat and, and collect, though, too, so... Who knows? We'll see. I'm also curious how deep that gameplay is and if they're not just relying on just selling toys to you. We're going to find out. Finally, they finish things off with Assassin's Creed Odyssey. I like the look of it. It takes place in ancient Greece. Yeah, the, the, the Spartans, which everyone got really excited about when they when they showed them. They introduced kind of a, a well, they introduced the ability to choose between either male or female protagonist. You can you can pick either one to start the game and you play through the entire game. Uh, as that character. So they have those options. That's fine. It's just more options for people to play as. And maybe they'll have some differences between the two. I think that'd be kind of funny if they had just different reasons to play through as either one, uh, whether people react to you differently, or, or, or maybe there are certain things you can do as one character can as the other. But it did seem like they were kind of carbon copies of the other, just one's male and one's female. So we'll... I don't know how different that's going to be. It just seems like an option. The gameplay looked good. The visuals looked very clean. Like, I was looking at the visuals and I said, wow, these are really, really good graphics. Um, and it's going to look good on the Xbox One X when I play it on that. I played Origins, but I'll be honest, I started to get kind of worn down by the game. I was getting kind of bored of it after like 15 or so hours. And I was like, okay, I'm kind of doing the same thing kind of over and over again. And it was just like getting a little boring. I like the setting of Greece with Spartans and everything. So I'm going to be checking this out. They also had a uh, different options you could choose for dialogue. They showed that out at length where you could lie to people and stuff and kind of mess up storylines that way. So maybe you have branching storylines with that too. Uh, it could be fun. It could be fun to see that. And that um, is interesting that it, it is coming out this year. It's October 5th. I thought Watch Dogs was coming out this year. Nope, they're skipping Watch Dogs. They're going with another Assassin's Creed. Maybe it's the setting. Maybe they had more time to work on it on their year off. I don't know, but hey, Assassin's Creed is coming this year, October 5th, and uh, you can look out for it. So they missed Splinter Cell. That one hurt. I'm going to be honest. I, I really, after the leaks and the rumors, the Splinter Cell, Splinter Cell, Splinter Cell, they show up in Ghost Recon, I thought it was going to happen. A lot of people thought it was going to happen, and a lot of people were kind of on where I was, where I was a bit disappointed. It wasn't as bad as that skate for hype where we saw Sessions, and then tell us the title right away, and I was like, oh, EA tricked us, and it was Sessions. I was like... I've played that game. I didn't like it that much. Uh, no, there was just no Splinter Cell. Now listen, Ubisoft never told us there was going to be Splinter Cell. They just heavily hinted at it with certain things. And then, of course, the rumors everywhere, the leaks, uh, the retail leaks and everything. And it was like, all right, cool. Splinter Cell's happening. Let's do it. Never shows up. That hurts. And also, people are saying Splinter or, or, or Prince Persia. Never heard of that happening. So I, I wasn't really expecting it. I just, maybe next year, right? That's all we can say right now. Maybe next year Splinter Cell comes back. Maybe it's just not ready right now, right? Maybe that's why Watch Dogs, maybe Watch Dogs isn't ready right now. We'll see. But that uh, Ubisoft was, it was okay. It wasn't amazing. It wasn't terrible. Um, cringy moments for sure. Get those microphones worked out next year, Ubisoft. That was borderline embarrassing <laughs> for the production with that. But it was, it was okay. It wasn't heavily disappointing. The only thing was no Splinter Cell. Everything else was fine. You know, New Assassin's Creed, people were excited. Um, just, it ran longer than it should have. It should have been no more than an hour. It ended up being like an hour 40 or so. Um, that's the, the one problem with live presentations. Let me know what you guys think about Ubisoft. I would say they absolutely nailed it right now. It's, uh, it was, it was just, it was fine. But I'm curious what you guys think about it down in the comments below. Let me know. Make sure you guys like the video if you enjoyed it, dislike it if not. And I'm gonna see you guys later on tonight for Sony. That's gonna happen at 9 p.m. Eastern. We'll go live about 8.30 p.m. Eastern time. There's already a page set up for you to go ahead and click remind so you can make sure you don't miss it with notifications on. It'll pop up. We'll have a good time seeing what Sony has for us tonight. I'll see you guys then.